the authentic Caribbean rum hangout sessions. Uh, today we have a very, very great company. So let me introduce you, our panel members that will be with us in these hangout sessions. From left to the right, uh, Ms. Sebastian Hilser from Germany. Uh, Dan Biondi from Italy. Hi. Hi, Dan. Uh, Jason Cosi is from New York in the USA. And at the end, uh, Peter Vestinos from Chicago. Hi, Peter. Thanks, all of you, to be with us. So the subject for today's Hangout session, it's about uh, sugar cane as the main source for rum production. Uh, but also, we want to talk about sugar cane, molasses, syrup, or use as main materials to product rum. So it will be very interesting if we start this uh, Hangout session just with a little bit of the background and history about the sugar cane. So, Bastian, uh, can you give us just, you know, a, a very uh, brief summary about the historical background of sugar cane and its use uh, in Latin America, Caribbean, and Europe, for example? I'll try to. Um, so, uh, to start off with the sugar cane, um, we have to go back. Um, quite a few years. Uh, actually, um, uh, it all originated in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, can you can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, good. Um, in Papua New Guinea, um, where uh, the first uh, sugar cane um, grew, and it was then taken um, uh, westwards. Um, so basically, um, it went over to um, Indonesia, to China, um, India, and um, with uh, the um, the uh, Arabs, it um, actually uh, ended up in uh, southern Europe, um, with the um, in Spain, uh, southern Spain, um, uh, and um, from there it was taken. Um, over to the Caribbeans um, on Christof Christopher Columbus's uh, second journey uh, in 1493. Um, uh, yeah, over to the Caribbean, where it uh, was then um, grown um, commercially um, and was uh, yeah base for sugar production um, as well as um, rum production um, in the end. Okay, great. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, Dan, do you have any other uh, uh, comments to add to the historical background? Or can you give us also maybe an example of the use of uh, the sugar cane in, in Italy? <laughs> no, not, not sugar cane in Italy. No, not yet. Maybe in the future. Uh, well, now regarding the, the historical background, just one point. Um, usually, uh, what is written in books, what is uh, generally shared, is that uh, uh, rum, uh, the history of rum, is a history of uh, of the molasses. So, a byproduct of the of the the sugar production, and uh, the the rum agricole, so rum from uh, sugarcane juice, is uh, just a matter of the last uh, century. So the end of the uh, 19th century and the, the, the beginning of the, the 20th. Yes. And, uh, and this, this is true, uh, but uh, um, maybe today we can share that uh, uh, there, there are some, some stuff that are not, not really uh, always written in books. Uh, the first is that uh, the rum for sure uh, start the, the the real production of rum starts from the from the molasses, but at the very beginning, as as Bastian said, uh, so uh, early 16th century, the very beginning, the rum was pr produced uh, straight from the juice, straight from the, uh, the the natural fermentation of the juice and the the really ancestral, let me say, distillation of this uh, of this wash, and. Um, and also, another point is interesting point is that uh, 
uh, today all the pro all the French producer that now produce uh, from from the Jews, so Rome Agricole from Martinique or Guadeloupe, uh, till uh, 100 years uh, 100 years ago, uh, they they were used to produce from molasses. So um, the, the, there are going deep. I mean, uh, island by island or history. Uh, is is very interesting that it is not is not so simple, and uh, is is really uh, related to the to the history and to the culture of of each each country each territory, and uh, the and and now the situation of uh, of the rum is exactly the consequence of of this uh, of this diversity I mean of of cultures, uh, it's, it's very interesting. In, Ita in Italy, in Italy, uh, yeah, there, are, there is no no sugar cane. Uh, maybe uh, in some centuries ago, before uh, before Columbus, maybe some some small uh, hectares of production, maybe in Sicily or, or somewhere else, but not now. <laughs> so uh, maybe some runs, but but not sugar cane. Some runs produced by by molasses uh, boat uh, somewhere but not not really not really uh, significant let me say okay thanks very much then uh, jason what about historical use of sugarcane in the usa do we have any reference about this uh, yeah well um, the history of of rum and and uh, sugarcane molasses um, ties in very closely with you know, the history of the United States with the colonies and uh, trade coming from um, the new uh, British colonies, particularly New England, um, back and forth to uh, the Caribbean islands. Um, specifically Massachusetts and Medford in Massachusetts has a, uh, a very rich, diverse history uh, with rum. Of course, you know, no one's growing cane uh, in the, uh, the temperate northeast, um, but there is, you know, we're Im importing a you know, commodity molasses uh, to distill rum in Medford and in other, uh, you know, New York, um, other uh, other colonies, and that was a uh, a cornerstone of of uh, you know colonial economics at that time. Um, not to mention uh, colonial society, you know, the tavern culture and uh, you know using the tavern as uh, as a, this corn this um, you know, basis for political thought and philosophical uh, thought uh, and whatnot. And that was closely tied with rum, that's what people were drinking back then. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Peter, do you have anything to add about the historical background? Uh, any comments, or uh, particular comments uh, for this uh, subject? Let me unmute here. Sorry, nothing much that's already been echoed. You know, as Jason said, I, I was, being from Massachusetts, I always like to remind people how integral uh, Massachusetts was in, in the development of rum, uh, especially in the ability for the the colonies to become its own uh, independent country by trading and building its uh, coffers for the war uh, through through rum trade and other trades. Um, but yeah, I think um, it, it's interesting right now that we're in, where we are in the U.S. right now with this big backlash against sugar, and you know people are afraid to see sugar on, on certain products. But at the same time, rum is enjoying a good renaissance and revolution, and um, uh, I don't think people really realize how integral rum has been to the development of the U.S. and actually the, the Western Hemisphere. Okay, thank you. Bastian, uh, do you want to say anything else? Sorry? Well, um, concerning uh, sugar cane, and, um, if, if you know uh, Germany and its climate, um, you know there's uh, not been much successful growth of uh, um, sugar cane here in Germany, but uh, uh, obviously, we have our, our history for um, molasses and and, um, and uh, actually rum. Um, some might know there um, is something called uh, rum verschnitt, uh, rum verschnitt, or rum blend, um, which was very very popular, um, which was actually brought over to Germany um, in the 19th century, 18th 19th century, um, where. Um, Germans bought um, so-called high ester uh, Jamaican rums, um, very bold and, and uh, flavorsome rums that um, were kind of an essence of rum, um, which were then imported um, into Germany and um, blended with uh, neutral grain spirit. 
um, and uh, that um, still is um, quite popular, at least uh, with um, a few older people um, that are still used to that uh, quite bold flavor. Um, and it's being drunk in, uh, especially around Christmas time, in punches and stuff like that. So. Um, uh, Molasses and, and uh, rum have uh, their fair share of history in Germany as well. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. Peter, uh, I want to be I want to want to be back with you, uh, but I want to change a little bit the subject. We I think we have enough background of history, which is really interesting for all the people that are watching us. But I think it's quite important to explain, or try to explain at least, the difference between you know the sugarcane juice sugarcane syrup and the molasses. So can you give us, you know, an, an explanation about how is this process and how is the transformation about this material coming from the same source, which is the sugarcane? Sure. Um, yeah, to be rum, or definitely be Caribbean rum, we need to come from three sources, which is the sugarcane uh, juice, the sugarcane syrup, or molasses. Uh, sugarcane juice, of course, is the fresh pressed uh, sugarcane. Um, uh, which um, is can ferment very quickly. Um, it provides often what we consider a, a, that rich sugar quality, that bright green grassy citrus note, very expressive. Um, but it, again, it does ferment very fast, and being in the Caribbean, you are in a warm climate, so in order to possibly uh, control the fermentation a little bit better or to store the product a little bit longer, you can reduce it by removing some of the water and you can create a sugarcane syrup uh, to make it a little bit more shelf stable and of course then we can uh, ferment from that. Or the third uh, and most popular is the uh, molasses rum. Um, I also like to remind people, you know, we, we throw around the word industrial and we throw around the word um, byproduct, but when you look at um, rum production or sugarcane production, what you're doing is you're actually getting three uses out of a crop much like in the U.S. where we would have um, cornfields, we would get three uses out of that crop. We'd get the grain. We could then um, cook it uh, into a mash and make bourbon out of it. Or, and then we could take that uh, spent mash and feed it to the pigs. So we'd have pig farms associated with bourbon production. Um, with sugar cane, we, we of course had the uh, sugar that would come out of it. Um, we would they also could produce the rum out of it. And then we would have molasses, which molasses is is not, not something that would be thrown away. It was actually very valuable. It was, it was a very important um, food source. Uh, I think the last thing I read something about um, about a tablespoon of molasses has as much iron and protein as nine eggs. Um, you know, this is a, a an area where there weren't wasn't a lot of other food being grown. This is a, kind of valuable. And it was a rich commodity that was then sent up to New England, of course. Um, so we can't. We you know we need to also think about moving away from the terms industrial and and byproduct, as molasses was an important uh, source. So uh, those are the three elements that we we can develop our rum from. Uh, you know molasses also then does provide a wide range of flavors. It's uh, you know a lot of people often think a molasses rum needs to be um, bitter or rich or heavy like molasses might be. Um, on the contrary, you can produce some very light, uh, flavorful. Um, brighter rums as opposed to some of the more funky, earth-driven, uh, fruitier rums like from Jamaica. Okay, thank you, Peter. I think you, you were saying something quite interesting about flavors. Uh, you were explaining all the process and the difference between these elements, but uh, Jason, uh, what do you think about, you know, the flavor at the, at the end of all this production? There is so much differences between the flavor of a rum made by molasses, syrup, or, or sugarcane juice. Do you find these differences like really clear, or you know? Oh, absolutely. On, oh, great. Yeah, they're very clear. I mean, as Peter was pointing out, um, the molasses is is a, is a richer, uh, is super concentrated flavor of, you know, that earthy flavors. Um, they tend to be, uh, you know, I feel like heavier, heavier bodied, uh, higher fruits, esters. Like uh, overripe strawberries and bananas, uh, and those flavors are very pronounced, and I, I find go very well with, um, you know, with a barrel aged spirit like a barrel aged rum, um, molasses, uh, molasses base. Those uh, flavors marry pretty well. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, the grassier agricoles, uh, your sugarcane base, uh, as Peter pointed out, they tend to have that vegetal kind of flavor. Um, you know, uh, spikes and citrus. 
Um, they pair well, uh, very well, I think, with with your greener kind of flavors. Um, I enjoy doing uh, like matcha green tea. I think pairs really well with uh, with an agricole. Um, these lighter uh, lighter flavors. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, Dan, uh, you were talking about uh, recently about you know the some. Uh, uh, rum styles, and actually you were talking about the uh, agricultural rum, for example. I think it, it will be nice and interesting to see if, well, actually last hangout session we were talking about the, the classification of, of the different styles we have. So can you explain a bit uh, or, or you know, uh, comment about the different classifications that we have at the authentic Caribbean rum mark on molasses and syrup? I mean, they fit always. Uh, if we talk about one uh, style that should be, you know, made by the same element, just molasses or just syrup, or we can mix a bit about this. How, yeah. how can you explain that situation regarding the different styles we have and the different elements we're talking about here? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not easy because of the of the diversity, as we said before. Um, I would like, before replying on that, I would like to. Uh, to add something to what Jason said before um, regarding how to uh, compare and how to recognize a, a, an agricola and a molasses run, uh, even if from the same island, as you said. Uh, I, I think that um, should be easier to understand uh, a, an agricola run or molasses run when it's white, because when it's white, uh, a rum can really reflect the, the raw material, uh, and so molasses or, or, or sugarcane juice, and consequently uh, the, the fermentation uh, of the raw material and, and the distillation in relationship of, of the uh, of, of country in your in which you are, of course. Um, when it's aged, uh, is uh, is a bit more difficult because. After three, four, or five years in the tropical aging, so not 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 really old, you know, it's enough to to have uh, four or five years to start to lose a little bit the the diversity of the raw material. That that's why I think that um, comparing white runs is easier to find the, the 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 grassy, the vegetable aromas, as Jason said, or in molasses rum, uh, the more basic. Uh, flavor of the of the of the raw material. Uh, we have an example, as you said, in uh, in Dominican Republic. Of, um, there are two distilleries, two distilleries both uh, in the in the in the authentic Caribbean rum range. Uh, one is uh, Brugal from molasses, uh, from Dominican molasses, uh, and one is uh, Barcelo that uh, uh, in the few years they started to use uh, uh, sugarcane juice from from the island, of course, and uh, comparing the white, uh, uh, even if they are both distilled in, in column steel, arriving over 90% of distillation, is still possible to, to find the, 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 the difference. But is is uh, is much more easy when you compare uh, longer fermentation or when you compare uh, pot steel distillation or, or, or also blend of uh, pot and column. So in this way you have more, uh, you have more concentration of, of, the, of the flavor of the raw material. Um, we, can, we can compare uh, Grenada, we can compare also Barbados, so example of islands in which there are uh, um, distilleries uh, that are using different raw material and uh, is uh, is really easy to to understand the the diversity. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Dan. Uh, Basti, do you have anything to add to the differences between any particular comment that will be interesting to share about you know different kind of elements we're talking about? Well, I, I, I think I um, have to agree with Dan that um, especially when um, training bartenders or talking to bartenders, it's, uh, I, I find it very important to 
um, to show them uh, lots of unaged rum um, as well, just so um, they they kind of uh, feel and taste um, the raw material um, before they then go on to um, like aged rums that are, that have been in, in, in oak casks for uh, 12, 15 uh, or more years and. Um, uh, it's it's nothing negatively, but uh, they will um, the the cask will um, just impart lots more flavor, and uh, you will lose the the direct touch to um, to the raw material uh, over time, and you just have a, a totally different um, product. And I think the the process um, to see how how this um, development uh, goes on, especially with uh, tropical aging, um, it really goes fast that way. Um, I think it's just important to always um, remember um, what rum is made from and, and um, how, how the raw material actually tastes, especially when you're talking to um, yeah, German bartenders who, who don't um, have experienced um, fresh sugarcane juice, for example, because it's just not common here um, in the country. So I think that's, that's always a, a very good um, thing to, um, to do. Thanks, Bastian. Uh, Peter, uh, I really want to know about a little bit of the, the knowledge of the consumers regarding this subject. Uh, I, I, please, can you give us you know, uh, comments about if you think that the RAM consumers in the USA, they are really aware about these differences between sugarcane, molasses, and uh, sugar syrup? They, they really understand about this source differences between, and it will be interesting to, to, to share and, and, and educate the people about these sources. Um, I, I think that's, that's our job, and, and I think there is a big gap there, and I think it's um, part of our new frontier. Um, you know, when consumers, and I'm not trying to knock anyone for lack of education or, or anything like that, it's, you know, when consumers see a dark rum, I think the, the, the assumption is, well, it must come from molasses. They just see a dark color and they assume that's where it's coming from, not recognizing that all distilled spirit is going to come out clear. Um, I know the uh, some agricultural producers in the last uh, year or two have done a lot of great work um, promoting agricultural rum in the U.S. So I would say consumers have started to understand what um, agricultural rum is, and, and I'm seeing it on more menus and I'm seeing more people ask for it, which is really impressive to see where it's come from uh, just four years ago. Um, so I, I would say some consumers are... are um, do you have good knowledge, uh, at least in major markets, of agricultural rum? Um, and at the same time, we have to do the work to make sure people don't dismiss uh, molasses rum. You know, I said earlier, we have to be careful about not calling it a byproduct or, or um, industrial. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, we have to be careful that we, we, we can make sure people understand that uh, rum traditionally has been made from uh, molasses uh, for most of its, its time, and you know, most rums on the market are made from molasses. And, it all depends on how it's fermented and the esters that develop in the fermentation and what happens, how and where we uh, distill. Um, as far as sugarcane syrup, I, I don't think uh, anyone would really uh, point out a sugarcane. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think a consumer would uh, really understand what a sugarcane syrup is or how it affects their, their final rum. Um, but I, I think we do have some work to do in educating not so much the source, but again, the styles. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jason, what, what do you think about this? What, what, what is your experience or your comments about your consumers and the feedback they give it to you about molasses, sugarcane juice, and, and sugarcane syrup? Well, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that Peter has uh, you know, had people asking for agricole and you know, demonstrating a knowledge of the difference. Uh, in New York, I haven't seen much of that outside of, you know, other bartenders visiting other bars. Um, your, you know, more uh, mainstream mainstream uh, consumer, to them, rum is rum. And uh, you know, I think outside the major markets, um, there's a definite uh, lack of, of knowledge on the difference in the base materials. Um, I've, I've talked to people that were surprised to know that, that rum came from sugar. And then asked if that meant it was bad for them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm never going to go out and say that alcohol is good for you outside of a, you know a drink a day uh, being good for cardiovascular health. But uh, uh, yeah, there's definitely um, a lot of work to do um, as far as educating people on your your base distillates, uh, be it 
you know, in whiskey, talking about the different types of of, of grains involved: barley, wheat, uh, corn. Um, to uh, to rum, talking about sugarcane, sugarcane juice, uh, molasses itself. Um, a lot of people just don't know. They think uh, you know, vodka comes from potatoes, and that's about it. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jason. Very very interesting, what you saw. Uh, Dan, what about in Italy? Do you think the people really really understand about the source of of, of rum regarding molasses, sugarcane, they, they appreciate that, or are they interested, you know, and learn a bit more mm -hmm. about this part of the process? Um, well, maybe um, since we are uh, close to France, we are lucky we are close to France, and uh, <laughs> maybe because of this reason, uh, it's easier to uh, for us to understand the, the French style, we, we started to have uh, uh, late in rums as a, as a country of uh, South Europe, let me say, we started to have uh, 20, 25 years ago uh, late, in, late in rums and uh, 10 years, 10, 15 years ago um, we started to have uh, uh, French rums, so agricultural rums and uh, immediately um, the difference uh, has been shown, has been presented, uh, not not for the consumer, uh, of course, but uh, but in the trade, in the rum lovers, the the, the difference is already, uh, I think, uh, is already understood. Um, what is true? Let me say, uh, every time I do a masterclass uh, to bartenders or to the trade. Uh, half of the people uh, still don't know don't know uh, what what it means. Uh, maybe younger younger uh, bartender. But if you go to people that already maybe uh, have drunk rum in the last uh, five years or um, ten years, uh, the, the difference between uh, juice and molasses is uh, is, uh, is 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 shared. I mean. Uh, what is what is true is that how how to communicate the, the different this difference because um, ninety percent of the times uh, the agricole rum is uh, uh, perceived as a uh, top quality and more prestigious more I, I think better communicated by 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 the French that's the truth and uh, the the molasses rum is more uh, light more for uh, mixology more the, for mainstream and and this is not necessarily true and so uh, is very important not only uh, if they understand the difference but uh, how they uh, react to 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 this difference I, I hope is is clear yeah sure thanks thanks Dan uh, uh, Bastian, uh, well, actually, Dan was talking about um, something quite interesting, and I think it will be yeah, the best way to end this session. And he was talking about mixology, so it's quite interesting to see the, you know, the different options that uh, you have, for example, to create a, a cocktail, taking into account the different sources. I mean, the, is there any big differences that you find to create a cocktail to use more? Different kind of elements, more citrus, for example, with one or another, uh, and which one will fit better to, to to present and to create a cocktail for consumers? And of course, also, if you want to tell tell us about you know the the knowledge of consumption uh, and sources in Germany, please go ahead. Well, uh, in, in in Germany, we have. Um, probably just like in uh, a lot of other countries, uh, we still have um, the Cuba Libre going strong, the Mojito, um, those are pretty much the ones that I um, that are most sold. Um, you also have some forms of Mai Tai cocktails, which I wouldn't men which I wouldn't say uh, they are classic um, recipes, uh, but more kind of a um, juicy rum lemonade. Um, also, uh, the piña colada; um, those are still going strong. Um, but on the other hand, you have um, quite a few um, like top bars that um, 
go further um, than um, than others. Uh, Actually, serving um, drinks like an El Presidente, um, a Dacuri obviously is is um, is a classic. Um, and uh, in all these drinks, you will uh, find different views of rum, um, obviously. And uh, if you have, for example, if you if you take a Mai Tai. Um, you can go ahead and, and um, use a uh, classic Jamaican aged rum, uh, like an Appleton VX or um, or other uh, others, uh, or you can actually go ahead and, and um, uh, mix an agricole um, uh, at least in parts into the into the recipe, um, which is really um, really fun, I think, and um, really interesting how the drink. Um, uh, suddenly changes in in flavor uh, profile, so um, the I think the the broad um, uh, diversity of of rum in in uh, concerning flavors um, lets um, or gives a mixologist uh, or bartenders um, a lot of room and and um, a possibility to play uh, with it in uh, in classic drinks as well as um, as new um, new mixtures. Thanks, Bastian. Uh, Peter, what about you? Uh, do you find any special difference to prepare a cocktail, taking into account the molasses or sugar cane or sugar cane syrup? Oh yeah, for sure. I, I don't think uh, as I said, I don't think there's any spirit out there that gives you such uh, depth and breadth as rum does in terms of uh, source material, where it's made and how it's aged. I mean, you, you have such an enormous palette when it comes to rum from, you know, a fairly light, delicate, um, then you move into your more citrus and uh, more sugary tasting rums, all the way right up into a nice aged amber style and uh, all the way up to, you know, stewed fruits and funky and earthy and rich. You have an amazing, um, even even in the proofs, you know, even in, when you start to look at um, a wide range of um, ABVs on, on rum, you have a lot of, a lot to work with there. Um, as far as it, how it applies to consumers, um, oddly enough, I've, I've seen a decline in, in cocktails like the rum and coke. Um, I haven't had one of those orders in a long time, oddly enough. Um, in the U.S., people people still like big flavors. Um, you know, the rum is the second largest category in the U.S., but most of that is spice rum. Um, but here in Chicago, we're we're very much a bourbon town. We're, we're very much a whiskey town. Uh, so people do see those darker rums and, and gravitate towards those. And um, I'm having a lot of consumers ask for uh, rum old fashions and rum Manhattans. <laughs> okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Jason, any any comments about the possibilities of Cocktails and different perfect serves with the yeah, different molasses and sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Jumping on to what Peter was saying, that uh, you know, I look at um, your molasses base, uh, particularly your aged molasses uh, rums, uh, you treat it as basically like a whiskey. You treat it like a whiskey, serve it like a whiskey. Um, you know, the, the rum Manhattan is pretty is pretty popular. Rum old fashions. Um, even looking at uh, variations of Negronis, like the Boulevardier, the rum Negroni. Um, and contrast to that would be would be looking at your agricoles as more of uh, your vodka, your gin t t style um, serves, um, you know. Uh, and, and then crossing over between those two would be the daiquiri. The daiquiri, I think, uh, works for both. Um, especially especially super delicious when you blend both styles. Um, there's this uh, this big tiki thing going on right now in uh, in New York. Um, and there's this saying in tiki, what you know, what rum one rum can do, uh, three can do better. So, when you mix your molasses-based uh, um, distillates with your with your uh, syrup-based or or, agri or excuse me, uh, sugarcane base, um, you do layer in a lot of flavors that complement each other and really kind of round out the body of a cocktail. Great, Jason. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Dan, do you have any? Yes, it's um for this. Subject regarding cocktails and the yes, use. I, I think I think it uh, was very interesting what Jason said that uh, daiquiri works with both, because what I think is that uh, when you uh, do a very simple cocktail, so with a, a citric part, let me say, and, and sugar part, so very basic, 
uh, it can work with uh, uh, with a Cuban RAM and is Daiquiri with uh, a, an Agricol White and is a tea punch uh, even if it's not strained in, in martini glass but is a, is in a small glass and you have your flip flop in the sand uh, it works in Brazil and is a caipirinha but the base is the same it works even with uh, with vodka sour or with uh, gin gimlet I mean the base is always the base it depends on the country in which you are uh, if you are in a vodka country or gin country or cachaça or agricol rum or molasses based rum so um, the the concept of cocktail or mixology is not really uh, Caribbean in means in, in terms of native people uh, is imported is an imported culture and so uh, the base of the, of, of the drink is uh, uh, can can be the same uh, for example you can have a planter sponge or a planter but it's exactly the same stuff uh, if you are in Barbados or you are in Martinique so um, the simple cocktail can work with uh, with uh, both molasses or juice rum. Uh, of course, if you go to uh, mojito, a mojito with a with a uh, agricole rum can can start to be a a, a monster because uh, <laughs> flavored rum with mint start to be uh, difficult. If you go to uh, aged rums. So the, the tannins of the aged rums can uh, is another tricky stuff in for for a mixologist. So um, when you when you go to the to the simplest stuff to the base, uh, you can uh, uh, you can make a, a, a perfect cocktail, um, and you can you can be in uh, in Guadeloupe or in Cuba or in Dominican Republic or uh, wherever you are so that's my my point and again uh, when you when you pour a white rum you can really feel the raw material so the daiquiri is uh, is exactly the, the the example as Jason said thanks uh, Daniel uh, we hope to see you your camera for the next for the next yeah, session sorry for my yellow face guys <laughs> No next problem. Time. Thank you very much again for, for your comments and I hope to see you next time uh, with your camera. Uh, Bastian, your turn. What, 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 what do you think about this, uh, uh, the, the possibilities of cocktails in Germany and if there is any special thing that, that you can share with us about you know, the, the German market in, 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 in this uh, subject? Well, as I said, um, there's still um, there's still not uh, too much news uh, in, in in terms of of cocktails um, when it comes to rum. Uh, lots of classic rum drinks are being being uh, drunk. Um, but what I do find um, quite interesting is um, a uh, yeah a, a certain trend um, towards uh, aged rums uh, here in Germany um, when it comes to um, yeah, being served as digestif or um, uh, on its own or maybe on a rock. Um, actually even um, uh, in a uh, old-fashioned or uh, in a Manhattan um, th there certainly is something that goes on. Um, a few brands have uh, opened uh, up this field um, a few years ago with lots of marketing spins and um, now you can actually see the, the development and um, the consumer actually um, at least a small part but a, a growing part of, of the consumers um, are actually recognizing um, rum uh, being a quality spirit or um, having yeah being a quality spirit that can actually be drunk neat um, and that still gives um, uh, at least uh, as much flavor as a as a whiskey can um, if it's if it's well uh, well made and uh, I think that's a quite um, interesting development over over the last um, uh, five or so years here in Germany. 
Thanks, Bastian. And, well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this uh, really, really interesting Hangout session. And I hope to see you in the next session we have to share all the knowledge about the ROM industry and the ROM world. And we'll stay in touch. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, all. We love ROM. Bye.